I'm the last speaker. Um, and I have very little to add uh, uh, to what has, all that has been said very rightly so about him as a personality, as a person. He was extraordinarily generous to uh, performers and composers, uh, and a man who really cared uh, very deeply about the music as a profession. I thought uh, instead of, uh, uh, since I was never a colleague of his and actually never a student either, uh, Maybe it uh, might be useful just to give a little hint of his historical position, because he uh, became famous in America at a moment which was very critical in all the arts during the uh, end of the Second World War. And the end of the Second World War for the arts had been was a very different. Uh, uh, it caused very different feelings among the artists at the end of the First World War. At the end of the First World War, the, the shock was so intense that without exception almost in all the arts, um, the great innovations that had been happening before the First World War were stopped. And there was a sense that we have to go back to the tradition, uh, what the French call the rappel of love. And you know about Stravinsky and ne neoclassicism, but Schoenberg and Webern were equally neoclassical in what they were doing. And uh, according to what they themselves said, the 12-tone uh, method was a method for uh, finding their way back to the classical form, the novel form and uh, variations and so forth. Uh, for Europe, not in America, and that's the difference. For Europe, the end of the Second World War was something else. And I suspect uh, it was really summed up by a very famous, very famous comment of Ogorno that after the Holocaust, uh, poetry is now <coughs> impossible to write. Uh, the art, the arts had the feeling that art was finally dead. And, but there were, of course, composers who wanted to write music and art, the, the painting and so forth. And um, for composers in Europe, there was a sense that we have to start from the beginning. Everything that has happened is finished. Uh, it's tainted by uh, what Europe has just done. Um, and uh, uh, this is not an opinion of mine. I am quoting, really, uh, Boulez and his description of his experience. And so when he began writing music, it was uh, really to start with something so different that even the composer wouldn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And so you can see from, for example, the first piece in Scripture 1, that he just invents a random series of numbers, and they, those numbers are turned into the pictures and the rhythms, and no composer, no human being could have any notion of what that piece would sound like, so they just did the, uh, the arithmetic and he wrote the piece. Uh, the point was, <coughs> get the composer out of writing entirely so that you can really start at the beginning. And this led, as many of you know, to a long period of learning the music in which the composer was doing the really little impossible. For the good composers, uh, 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 composers who continue to want, want to write like Velez, um, he uh, eventually, uh, rather swiftly, Develop a, a used the 12, uh, a 12 tone idea uh, in a very complicated way of derivation so that you couldn't possibly find it. And he told that to me, he didn't want it found. And in fact, it took 40 years for somebody, uh, <laughs> and really, um, musicologist decoded the Marteau, and uh, uh, Boulez was not a new. <laughs> <laughs> the situation in America. And in one sense, Milton was a part of that movement, certainly uh, starting with the 12th tone rule. Uh, but uh, l uh, let me just put it this way. Very famously at that time, Boulez had said that uh, Stravinsky was dead, that uh, excuse me, Schoenberg was dead. And that was a very famous article of his. And equally, that Stravinsky had written nothing worth listening to since uh, the right of spring, which is pretty much whole, the whole work of Stravinsky. Uh, and Milton, as you probably know, was a very close friend of Stravinsky, loved the classical music, and people just said it was uh, 
love Broadway and music, and as everybody who saw me just said, was very interested in uh, music of all kinds, composers who are really doing their craft and were not doing what he was doing. And I personally had the same experience that um, the other composers here have, have mentioned. Um, it meant that um, in spite of the impression he sometimes gave that there was no connection between his music and um, what preceded it, uh, there was. He was very conscious of the music of the past, and you heard his two favorite composers, and that included Brahms, who was really his most favorite composer. Um, so that uh, the music that he wrote, uh, let me put it this way, we, uh, another difference with Europe, where with Boulez, for example, you could really not find what the rows were when he, uh, as long as he was writing rows. With Milton, the early music, in, up to the middle of this period, it would take you, if you wanted to figure out what the rows were, you look at the score, it takes you five minutes to find it. It is absolutely obvious. His point was, he was using certain systematic procedures because, and he wanted them felt, they were a part of the music. And as he went on at Prendy's, he, um, he got interested in more subtlety and more variety, and it got more and more complicated, and the late music is not easy uh, to find. Uh, uh, and in my opinion, which may be controversial, I think it is worth looking to see uh, what the system was, uh, because, uh, for, let me put it this way, his music is always extraordinarily original. There's no music that sounds like this in one second, you know, that's Milton. It's extraordinarily original, and it's very attractive on the surface, but to get the real quality of the music, uh, you, need to, you do need to know how he had done it. Um, and that takes some doing, but if you care about music, um, uh, it will make the experience that much he did give the, appear, uh, uh, the appearance when he spoke of thinking logically, mathematically, thinking in terms of the system. Um, uh, uh, a lot of the articles do give that impression. And I could say it's an example of the one maxim that I know of that is always true, which is never trust a composer talking about his own music. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in this case, I would end with a little story. Uh, I remember hearing a piece many, many years, and I can't remember, I think it may have been the second string quartet, but I'm not sure. It may have been here at NEC, or it may have been at um, Sanders uh, Harvard, uh, but it was not a good performance. And Milton afterwards, uh, historian, and he complained. He said, it, uh, this was really a terrible performance. What I miss, he said, are my fingers. <laughs> the little moments, the little moments. And like every composer and everybody who cares about music, you're listening at the moment. And if the moment is so meaningful, it's because of everything that has happened uh, that put that moment in context and, and make it meaningful as a contrast or as a repetition. And as it, if it's a repetition at that particular moment, but it is the moment you're listening to. And hearing Milton 